What does God think about ministerial titles? Hi, I'm Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Pastor, and Teacher David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. It is so good to be back together again as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. Today, we're starting a new chapter in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 23. And I absolutely love this section that we're moving uh, towards in Matthew. Um, Matthew 23 is Jesus is, uh, deriding the scribes and Pharisees and lots of good juicy information there that is actually helpful for us as we look at ourselves and look at uh, spiritual leaders today. And then on into Matthew 24 and 25, the all of it discourse, all that end time stuff. So I'm really looking forward to, to uh, uncovering that together as we work our way through this. Now, you will recall that in Matthew 22, Jesus had just been uh, speaking to Pharisees and Sadducees who came to test him on various questions, trying to nail him uh, on something that he'd say uh, publicly that they could use against him uh, in order to uh, affect his, uh, his death, which uh, they did. But uh, Jesus wasn't fooled, he wasn't stumped on any occasion. And once their questioning is over, once they're silenced, then Jesus begins to address the crowd uh, regarding uh, his opinion of the scribes and Pharisees. And uh, he spends a whole chapter on it uh, in Matthew's gospel anyways. Really, really good stuff. Let's begin reading in verse number one of Matthew chapter 23. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. So it's a mixed group saying, quote, the scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. And he elaborates on that. So we'll go on the elaboration in just a second. The whole, that, that phrase, the chair of Moses, uh, there's some question as to whether uh, it's just a phrase that Jesus uh, used spontaneously that didn't have any, have any reference to any literal chair. Uh, you know, it's so, so just a, a way of saying that, that they put themselves in the place of authority, speaking on behalf of Moses and the law of Moses. But there are some who make uh, some uh, attempt to tell us, uh, and I think they have some legitimacy, I don't know whether it's true or not, that of course in every synagogue uh, there was a certain seat from which when the scrolls were read by the leader of the synagogue, he would sit in that seat that perhaps was called the seat of Moses. I, I kind of tend towards that because of what Jesus says, because he says, you know, do what they tell you to do. Well, if they were doing their perverse teaching, um, twisting the law of Moses and making it uh, meaningless and nullifying the commandments of God, then I don't think Jesus could have said that. I think he's only could be making reference to when they're reading to you, when they're quoting to you from the law of Moses, from the official seat within the synagogue, when you hear that on the Sabbath, then do what they tell you to do because they are reading from the law of God, the law of Moses. But, you know, when they're giving their sermons and then taking the scriptures out of context and twisting, twisting them, and as we've talked about so many times, you wouldn't want to listen to them then. Jesus spent a great deal of time correcting the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees. So that's my take on that. And he says, you know, so again, back in verse number three, Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. Again, has to be when they're reading from the law. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not do them. So there were things that they were saying that were right and proper. Anytime they read from the law of Moses, that'd be the case, right? Sure. Uh, so do it, but they're not doing it, so don't, don't imitate them. And then here's the elaboration. Um, in verse number four of 23, they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. And so it seems that that's a criticism of them even going beyond the requirements of the law because Jesus refers to it as heavy burdens that are laid upon people's shoulders by the scribes and Pharisees. If, he, if that was a reference to the law of Moses, that would be a criticism of himself, right? Because Jesus, you know, in one way or another, we can say gave the law of Moses. He was and is God and it was given by God. So it seems like, again, this is that they're taking the law of Moses and even adding 
a considerable burden to it. And we know historically that is exactly what, what the case was. For hundreds of years, the spiritual leaders in Israel had been building what were known then as fence laws that were all written down. You can read them today. And they were designed to keep people from ever transgressing God's law but, but by putting a fence around them. So if you, if you keep these fence laws, there's no way you're ever going to you know, commit the sin of breaking God's actual law. Remember, we've talked about some of those things before. The whole thing about, you know, you should not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Well, they took that one commandment and then built all kinds of commandments around it to where today you know you have that uh, all the all the uh, the kitchen separation of uh, of um, dairy and uh, and of and of meat and so forth uh, lest we inadvertently somehow boil a, a kid in its mother's milk and so forth and so those were part of the fence law so I think those in my opinion are what Jesus was talking about these fence laws these extraordinary burdens that God never intended for people to have to be even thinking about okay uh, and and here here's the hypocrisy of it these guys who are making these fence laws that are becoming these huge burdens upon people beyond just the 600 laws of the old old covenant they're given those laws they're formulating those laws but they themselves aren't even keeping those laws Okay, and uh, I, I think this chapter has a, a great deal of application to um, you know spiritual leaders in the past and in the present as well. Um, certainly, it's directed at Israel's spiritual leaders, and so this would be a good chapter for spiritual leaders today to examine themselves in light of what Jesus said. It'd be good for all of us to examine ourselves in light of what Jesus said, because there are spiritual principles. Jesus is going to tell us a lot of things that he doesn't like about spiritual leaders, but not just spiritual leaders, about people who are under spiritual leaders. Okay, so all of us probably are in that category. We need to take heed to what he says. So that being said, I'm very excited to spend uh, some sessions here with you as we work our way through um, Jesus's uh, denunciation of the scribes and Pharisees, okay? So uh, there's a lot more to come and um, it's gonna be good, all right? Love going through the Word of God with you. I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. We're in Matthew chapter 23 as Jesus tells us his opinion of the scribes and the Pharisees. And he didn't have a very high opinion of these fellows. And I wonder what Jesus would say about some of our spiritual leaders today with, uh, in the, within the realm of Christendom and even within the realm of uh, evangelicalism. Uh, because I, some of what he says kind of reminds me of some of these guys. We just covered the first part of chapter 23, where Jesus um, denounced the fact that they would uh, set a higher standard for their parishioners than they themselves <laughs> would uh, abide by. And everyone who's a spiritual leader needs to make sure that the bar that he or she is setting above the people uh, being served is a bar that is being set for themselves, right? Very, very serious stuff. Otherwise, it's just hypocrisy. And Jesus used that very word, didn't he, in this chapter. So now we're going to jump down to uh, verse number 5 of Matthew 23. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. And when it comes to pleasing God, God's always looking at the heart of the matter, our hearts. Because what's in our hearts is what then determines uh, the words that come out of our mouths, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it also reveals what, uh, uh, it also determines our actions, what is in our hearts. So hearts are the place to clean up first. And that's why you have to be born again to be pleasing to God. You have to be transformed by the Holy Spirit and you have to repent within your heart. And you have to align your heart with the will of God. So look at verse number five of Matthew 23. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Well, these are just really silly, superficial things. Um, uh, the phylactery, of course, is a, a, a wooden box that has a little 
uh, paper fragments, uh, or in his day, vellum fragments of scriptures written on them in the box with a leather cord attached, and it was tied around the head as a means of uh, symbolizing that we need to keep God's word in our mind and to obey God's word. A and so Jesus said, you're, you're, they're broadening their phylacteries. Wow, you got a big box on your forehead. You know, that's kind of equivalent, I guess, to the person uh, who takes the mammoth Bible to church, you know, just so everyone would see, wow, you must be a real deep scholar and so forth. Again, I'm not saying anything wrong with the big mammoth Bible. All I'm saying is when it's done purely for show, you know, it's wrong. And Jesus also talks about the lengthening the tassels. Oh my goodness. You know, these, these are not uh, major issues of uh, importance and holiness to God. There's nowhere in the Bible you can read where God says, wow, big Bigger phylacteries and longer tassels, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> you know, that's ridiculous, okay? But that's where they were at. And, and so they're just trying to put on a show before others so that others will think more highly of them. And so they love the praises of men and they're not pursuing the praise of God. That's something that not only applies to spiritual leaders in our uh, experience, but also to ourselves. If we find we're leading a double life, that is, one life that's public, a different life that's private, then that shows something wrong in our hearts. Okay, and I've been guilty of that, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm confessing that because I'd be a hypocrite to, to, to say otherwise, all right? So, but that's the sign, uh, and that's when we know, oh my goodness, something's wrong in my heart. So I don't just clean up my outward act. I look in my heart and say, what is wrong? If I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, I wouldn't be acting two different ways. There wouldn't be any contrast between public and private life, okay? Jesus, Jesus mentioned that. Uh, just if you give me a chance to, to mention this to you very briefly, he talked about those uh, in the Sermon on the Mount who you know, pray publicly and they're only doing it to be seen by men. He said, you, when you pray, go, go to your private closet. You know, so if we can ask ourselves, if the only time I pray is when I'm involved in a public meeting and I never pray privately, then you know, what is that saying about my real motive uh, for praying. It's obviously not praying because I love God. I'm praying because I love the praises of people. I want them to see me pray. Um, keep on reading here, verse number six of Matthew 23. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. And so again, it's all just for show. And get this one, and respectful greetings in the marketplaces and being called, quote, rabbi or teacher by men. They love those respectful greetings. So Jesus then calls them out and gives some very specifics. And I think this has incredible application to our modern day. I think that there are multitudes of so-called ministers who need to read and to heed what we're about to, to, to read from the lips of Jesus. He said, Verse 8, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. So that is, if someone calls you rabbi, you're supposed to resist that and say, no, 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 don't be calling me rabbi. I'm, I'm nothing. We've all, we've all got one teacher, and so I, I, want to, I want to bounce that respect you know, and deflect it from, from me because you, you, you got me set too high, and, and let's look to God. He's the real source of all truth and teaching wisdom. All that I am is just uh, one who does my best to, to say what he would say and to be faithful and true to his word and his commandments. So I'm nothing more than just a scribe as, of sorts. I, I'm just telling you what God has said. And um, he, he says, because one is your teacher and you're all brothers. So again, that emphasizes the fact that, that within the body of Christ, within, within true Christianity, true Christendom, we're not supposed to elevate people unduly. Uh, we're not supposed to be enamored by teachers. Um, we're all brothers. We're all equal in, in that sense. And I, I see that fault you know, in, in not only teachers, who love the respectful greetings and demand that you refer to them with those respectful greetings, but also with the, the common people who are listening to the teaching. They're so enamored sometimes with the teaching uh, that all they talk about, have you heard this word? Have you heard this guy's message? Have you sat under his ministry? Blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on and on about the teacher, you know, the human teacher neglecting the divine and only true teacher, all right? Well, more titles to avoid. We're gonna talk about this. Be right back.
Alrighty, welcome back. We are in Matthew chapter 23, this entire chapter where Jesus just uh, tells us what he thinks about the scribes and Pharisees, and we're trying to find application to it uh, in our own lives. He has uh, just uh, hit the nail on the head as far as the scribes and Pharisees were concerned. The big trouble was they, they weren't regenerated. They, they weren't uh, truly uh, transformed by the Holy Spirit. They really didn't love God. They, they didn't have a heart change. They never repented of their sins and experienced the grace of God in a transformation. So they were just religious, not righteous, a veneer of holiness, but no change on the inside. And so their motives were wrong. They were doing it for show. And they, they loved all the perks that they got uh, being religious leaders, one of them Jesus is, is honing in on is their love of the respectful greetings. We talked last time about teacher, and Jesus told his followers who were in that crowd, don't let people call you teacher. You know, because then you're, in a sense, robbing what rightfully belongs to God. You're allowing your disciples to look too much to you and not enough to God. And, and man, this is important. Um, <laughs> I have to confess to you, when, when I was a pastor, people always wanted to call me Pastor David, Pastor David. And, and it bothered me because of the fact that I read this right here. I didn't want to get caught in that trap of, you know, I love that being that respectful title that these folks give me. I never called myself Pastor David. I never referred to myself that way. Um, and in fact, I asked the people in my churches, if you want to give me a title and, and you want to do it biblically, call me Slave Dave. And, uh, you know, that's a reminder to you and me, I'm nothing more, and I'm not called to me anything more than a servant. And you, you don't want to have your eyes on me. If I have any blessing to you, if I have any gift from God, it's only because God gave it to me. And so you ought to be looking to him. You know, I'm the nobody. He's the everything. And it's hard to break people in that habit. It's, it's hard uh, for people not to want to call you some kind of respectful title. Uh, I think the greater crime is when we demand that greater title. I've met pastors who, you know, goodness, their own wives call them pastor. Pastor so and so, you know, good grief. This is your this is your this is your husband. And every time you talk to him you call him pastor? You know, but you're trying to send an example for the church to respect the man of God. Ah, oh, something's out of kilter here. It certainly doesn't fit what Jesus was saying, okay? Um, the next thing he says um, let's see, this is, we read verse 8, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and you're all brothers, so that was resisted, stop people from calling you teacher. And then in verse number 9, do not call anyone on earth your father. So now he's talking to people who, you know, are, are speaking to the folks with the titles. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. I can never understand those denominations and groups that that's the title they have given to their leaders. And everyone calls them Father so-and-so. Again, it's a, it's a transgression of a very clear commandment. And I don't think it's just limited, you know, well, you can't be called leader, you can't be called father, and, and you can't be called rabbi, but any other title is great. So his, his awesome holiness, righteous, you know, most awesome anointed one, you know, that would also be a transgression of this, okay? Anytime we're, we're, you know, wanting people to give us those respectful titles, or anytime we're giving someone in the body of Christ a respectful title, we're missing it. You, could, you, you know, the Apostle Paul, you never see any of his letters he wrote, said, this is from the Apostle Paul. Never did he use the title Apostle Paul. He, uh, he would at times say, Paul, 
called as an apostle. So it was a calling, but he never gave himself that title, never, you know, uh, spoke of himself in that way. And if anyone had a right to, to a title, you know, I think Paul would be certainly in that category. All right, so, so does that mean that we don't call our earthly fathers father? Well, again, there's a connotation here that we'd have to take in consideration. There is, um, uh, you know, the difference between the, 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 the original Greek word, the connotations there, and what children called their parents back in those days. I don't think that the, the essence of this is Jesus saying, your earthly father, you all use the word father or dad or whatever, that this would be a wrong thing because God is your father. Now, he's talking in the context of spiritual leaders, referring to them as father and, and usurping something that rightfully belongs to God. See, that, that's the spirit of this. And so let's be careful, you know, I, I actually know of somebody who doesn't call his own earthly father father because of this. All right, I think that's a little bit off balance. And then the last thing, uh, Jesus now speaks to leaders among his disciples. Verse number 10, do not be called leaders for one is your leader. Isn't that something? Don't be called leaders. One the, for that is Christ. So I, I don't know. It seems to me like we're missing this. And, and we've just got too much focus on people and not enough focus on God. You know, think about the phrase, how it's often used. Here's our worship leader. Okay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Do not be called leaders for one is a leader. You know, how about worship servant? Because that's the next thing that Jesus said, verse number 11. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. That's what impresses God. And you can impress people with your titles and all your letters after your name and so forth and your, you know, your resume, but none of that impresses God. What God is looking for are people who are humble. And that's what he says in the next verse. This is where I want to shut down. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. Whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. And clearly, that doesn't have a universal application to just the short term of this life, that everyone who exalts himself in this life gets humbled in this life. No, 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 no. This is within the, within the span of eternity. And I'm afraid that many of us who have uh, grabbed onto all the titles that we can, we have this today in the body of Christ, or maybe not the body of Christ, but within Christendom anyways. You know, for a while, everyone wanted to be a bishop, and so everyone was suddenly a bishop. If they had two churches or two home Bible studies, they were a bishop. Now they've all got the title of apostle because they've actually maybe planted uh, two Bible studies in two houses, and so now they're an apostle. You know, just grasping at titles. This is a sin. This is a transgression. You're exalting yourself. The day will come when you will wish you hadn't exalted yourself. You'll wish you had gone by servant rather than apostle. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff to think about, and more of this next time. I'll see you then. God bless you.